the Welsh Lady ASMR live, first live stream actually on YouTube for a long time and I'm very excited to be here with you and we are going to start this book this evening, Jim and the Universe by DM Green and you can probably hear in the background some church bells and Monday evening where I live the church bells have their practice or rather the bell ringers and I normally love it but I had forgotten about that when I suggested this live so I do hope the tune of the bells adds to the experience of this um, lovely gorgeous book and the high <laughs> Uh, how lovely of you to join. Um, now then, let me tell you a little bit about Jim and the Universe before we start diving in, for whom the bell tolls, absolutely. They will stop and then they will come back and we'll hear a little tune and then it will stop again. So I don't know if you have ever heard of the Law of Attraction or people talking about the Universe. I have had an interest in sort of all things universe related for years and I came across this book last year and um, I bought it initially on my Kindle, devoured it in a couple of days and then I had to go and buy a, a hard copy because I knew I wanted to read this live and I've been thinking about doing it live for quite a while and then all of a sudden I'm sure possibly the universe I just the other day I thought I'm going to ask the author if they would mind me reading this to you live in a whispered way and I am thrilled to say that DM Green the author has said absolutely so I am honestly so excited. It's a book that is so, um, lends itself, I think, to a whispered ASMR for relaxation because the theme of the book, I identify so much with Jim, the hero of this book, a born warrior, a child who was born into a family of warriors and I don't know if you can identify with that, I know I can. Um, and, you know, it's just day-to-day -day life of this boy and the people he meets, this one lady in particular, and how his life changes. So I am really, really thrilled to be starting this this evening. Hope you're going to enjoy it. We're going to read maybe one or two chapters. I'm going to be here for about an hour and um, we'll see how far we get in that time. And I will be back tomorrow. Wednesday and Thursday. More chapters from this book. So, um, Flo, that's such a lovely comment. Thank you. Um, and I think this book is going to help a lot of people relax, particularly if you're quite anxious, get over worried about things. And uh, when I whisper it, hopefully that will help you feel nice and relaxed as well. So, I'm going to start off, I'm going to be whispering the, the blurb at the back of the book so you've got a general idea. And then we'll start reading the chapters. As I read, I'm not, I'll am not. i keep my eye on the chat as far as I can, but my eyes are going to be reading the book. But I will come back at the end, catch up with some of the comments and a shout out to some of you lovely people who are joining in. Um, but yeah. A big thank you to DM Green for allowing me to do this. So let's start by reading the back of the book. And I'm going to put my reading glasses on. Jim is an 11 year old boy who worries about everything. One day Walking home from school, he meets a woman who introduces him to the magical power 
of the universe and soon his whole life changes. This is a heartwarming, funny story that carries an important message about how to live your life. One reader said, it has brought a tear to my eye, made me laugh out loud, taken me back to some bad memories of many, many years ago, and resonated with my life now. Inspired, truly inspired. I have put, I think, in the description a link, Amazon link, as my affiliate link for this book and please check out the author DM Greens. We've got a Facebook page. Um, if you go onto Facebook and look up DM Green, um, you'll see the information on him and the book. Right, that's the cafe. Story for Billy. was the size of an ant on the horizon. Make sure you put your shoes on. There goes the church bells. Was another. If Jim mentioned he was considering going to play football. If they took a day trip somewhere, the car journey would be filled with prophecies of doom about the weather a car parking space or somewhere to eat. On the way home, it was similar, with Jim's mum producing a list of all the things that had gone wrong in the day, even if it had all been fairly pleasant. Jim's dad was also a worrier, but often didn't his head behind a newspaper in the evening. This made for a rather explosive combination with Jim's mum, who would constantly pour her fears into Jim's dad's ears. Like a witch, mixing a nasty potion in a cauldron. Eventually, Jim's dad, carrying all of these worries in him, like a volcano full of lava, would erupt and an argument between them would begin. This was what Jim worried about the most, though he tried to hide it, even from himself. He would go to his bedroom, close the door, sit in a corner and read a book. This was his escape route. Yes, he had a computer and games he could play on it and he did. 
from time to time. But that was only really fun with his brother, who was older and often out a lot of the time. Reading was his real pleasure, a type of magic that transported him anywhere in any time. He lived through all sorts of adventures. A boy attending a school for wizards, orphans running away from home, small people finding powerful rings in a fantasy world. All of this could happen while his parents downstairs, exhausted from their argument about changing a light bulb, though it wasn't really about changing a light bulb. It was really about something else. Had gone their separate ways for a little while. And Mum would shout up the stairs to say that Jim's tea was ready. Jim would go downstairs where he could feel the old argument hanging in the air like weights around his neck. And the whole family would eat their dinner in silence. It was no surprise then that when the summer holidays came to an end and his mum was getting things organised for him to start high school in September, Jim was feeling very worried. Obviously, most children were worried. Of course they would be. But for Jim, it was much worse because he came from a family of warriors. Those last few precious nights of the summer holidays were filled with panic and sleeplessness. Jim would toss back and forth, shifting pillows and duvet one way or another without success. However he positioned himself, he could not sleep. Too many unknowns about what was to come filled his mind and his imagination. So powerful from all that reading made them bigger and bigger and bigger. In his mind he saw himself wandering around infinite corridors, never able to find his way. He saw himself being yelled at by a teacher for not doing his homework on time, even though he found all the tasks too difficult to understand. He saw himself trapped in changing rooms by some older boys intent on turning him upside down and flushing his head down the toilet. All these were the horrors that the other children in his class at primary school had told him. Information gained from older brothers and sisters. One boy, Jamie Warren, had terrified Jim with a story provided by his sister, apparently. When you made it to year eight, if you made it to year eight, you had to have an injection in your arm with six needles all at once. His sister, Jamie said, still had the scar. With the entire summer holiday 
ahead of him. Jim had forgotten all about these tales of terror. But now, with only a few days left before the nightmare began for real, he could not stop thinking about them. He decided to consult his brother, John, who had been at high school for two years already. Of course, he came from a family of warriors, and this meant they invested more energy into worrying about things than being open about their feelings. Jim spent some time in his own bedroom, debating how best to approach the issue with his brother, before crossing the landing to knock on his bedroom door. Come in, he heard John say through the door. He opened it to see his brother sat on his bed, playing a football manager game on his laptop. All right? Yeah, said Jim, hastily. I was wondering, uh, cause some of my mates haven't got any older brothers or sisters, and they were asking, what's high school like? His brother continued to play his game. It's all right, he said, not looking away from the screen. Jim stood in the doorway silently, unsure whether he was satisfied with the answer or not. Occasionally, his brother clicked his mouse or tapped on the keyboard, seemingly engrossed. He decided to ask another question, to probe a little bit further. Do they really flush your head down the toilet? John snorted a quick laugh while continuing to look at the screen. After a moment, he said, Nah, that's all a load of rubbish. They tell you in primary school to scare you. He paused the game and turned to face Jim. It's all right, you know. You get used to it pretty quickly. They show you around and stuff, so you don't get lost. He gave a brief but reassuring smile and went back to his game. This was John. Jim knew he could rely on him for sound advice and honesty. They had lived through their parents' explosive arguments together. Okay, it's cool. Cheers, Jim said, and left the room. He felt a bit more at ease. He could trust his brother, and felt a bit happier, knowing he would be at the school too, if he needed him. He was still anxious, but not as much as before. The wild fantasies, like captured beasts, had calmed down and relented from taunting him for now. One night in the week before school started, Jim's mum made Jim's favourite meal, fish pie. It was crammed full fish, peas and creamy sauce and there were thick layers of mashed potato with crunchy melted 
melted cheese on top. Jim could eat plateful after plateful without any complaint. He loved the softness of the mash next to the crunchiness of the cheese and the different textures of the fish below. Jim's mum was a great cook and he quite liked the idea of cooking for himself. He remembered baking with his mum when he was younger. But even in the kitchen, she could be stressed and with hot pots and pans, didn't always feel like a safe place to be. After dinner, Jim's mum laid his school uniform out on his bed. Put this on and come downstairs so I can take a photo. She was obsessed with taking photos. Jim wasn't sure why. In despair, he stared down at the clothes he would have to wear most days for the next year. It didn't have the fun, light blue colours of his old primary school uniform. It was darker, less colourful, more serious. There was a tie as well. stripes. He had no idea how to put it round his neck properly. Something else to worry about, he thought. As Jim made his way downstairs, clad in new uniform, he felt like a clown. Everything was much too big for him. His sleeves his hands, his trousers drooped down around his ankles. The tie was a mess. Jim had tried to use a similar method to tie his shoelaces so that it ended up looking like a bizarre bow tie. You'll grow into the clothes, Jim, said his mum. He wasn't sure how long that would be. Clive, can you help him do his tie? Jim Star lowered his newspaper and looked up over his reading glasses. Okay, he said. Let's go and do your tie. And off they went to stand in front of the hallway mirror. Over, under, over, under, round, through, tuck. Jim had no idea. He practiced and practiced, but every time he did it, he worried about getting it wrong. imagined himself having to do it in the changing rooms with all the other boys watching him and he kept getting confused. Don't worry, his dad said. You'll get there in the end and wandered back to his newspaper. Jim looked at himself in the mirror and frowned. He tore off the tie in frustration. I'm going to bed, he called as he walked up the stairs. What about the photo? His mum shouted from the living room. Do it in the morning. I might have grown a bit more by then. Jim slammed his bedroom door shut, took off his clothes and threw them in a pile on the floor. He climbed into bed and grumbled himself to sleep. Chapter 2 With Church Bell Accompaniments 
in the last few days before the beginning of school. Mum made an excellent effort to spend time with Jim and John. She took them up the Shard in London and they went round Norwich Castle. Considering Mum was such a worrier, the days were generally a success. Jim loved visiting castles, particularly because it suited his imagination. He could picture himself living a thousand years ago when there was no such thing as high school. Sadly, however, the dreaded first day drew closer and Jim's worry increased. For all their problems, his family were a loving bunch and they did his best to ease his troubled thoughts. First came Dad, knocking on the door while he was packing his school bag. Dad said, Your mother has asked me to take you to school in the morning on my way to work. I can drop you off just round the corner. Great. Thanks, Dad, Jim said, trying to sound thankful rather than worried. Next, it was Mum. She came in and said, I've turned your trousers up, Jim. They should fit you properly now. That's great. Thanks, Mum, Jim said, trying not to sound ungrateful because his jumper was still far too big for him. Finally came John with a solution to Jim's biggest concern of all, the tie. Here, try this, John said, chucking the tie at him. It was his school tie, pre-tied, with a perfect knot. The only problem was the hole to put his head through was far too big knot would hang some way down his chest. Uh, thanks, John, he said questioningly. Put it over your head, his brother replied. Hold the knot and pull the thin bit. Jim did what he was told and the knot moved up to his neck without getting smaller or tighter. There you go, said John. Now you won't have to worry about tying it up after PE. Just slide it on and slide it back off again. I did that the whole way through year seven. So Jim put on the tie and was satisfied. He slid the knot up and down several times and found it all very easy to use. She is brave, he said. The hours of the last day seemed to slip through his fingers and soon it was time for bed. He did not sleep particularly well. His mind was racing with bizarre dreams of toilets chasing him and giant eight-pronged needles. He woke several times in the night, worried that he might be late, so that when he finally did get to sleep, he overslept. His first day of school started with a sudden awakening caused by the panicked entrance 
of his father into the bedroom. Come on, boy. I got to leave in 20 minutes and you're not even up yet. Oh no, thought Jim. He just knew this was a bad start. Clive, calm down, he heard his mum say from downstairs. It's his first day. I know, but I've got to get to work, his dad replied with raised voice. He leapt out of bed and rushed downstairs for a quick bowl of cereal, but stubbed his toe on a step on the way and ended up hopping around the hallway. Foot nursed and cereal eaten in record time, Jim accelerated back upstairs to the bathroom where he quickly washed his face and brushed his teeth and hair. Next, he dived into his bedroom to get dressed. He could hear his dad revving the car on the drive outside. Pants, socks, shirt, tie, jumper and trousers. Perhaps a little too short now. Once more, he shot downstairs, gave a hurried goodbye to his mother as he put on his shoes and raced out the door to his dad's car where he and John were waiting. Right, let's go, his dad said. And off they went. did not take very long and after panicking about being late he found that his dad had dropped him off incredibly early so that he could get to work on time. His father always worried about being late to work. The playground at the front of the school was notably empty and only a couple of other Innocent Year Sevens loitered in its lonely corners. Seconds after he heard his father's car roar away, his brother said something that made Jim's heart sink. Where's your bag? What a disaster. In his rush to get to the car in time, he had forgotten to pick up his school bag. John noticed the look of horror on his face. Here, he said, passing Jim a pen. I can lend you this today. It should be all you need. Good old John, saving the day once more. You need to wait here. I've got to go to the other playground for other older pupils. Have a good day, he said, giving Jim a reassuring smile, which he tried and failed to copy. He looked around at the other year sevens and couldn't build the courage to go and speak to them. He simply stood there in his corner and became another lonely statue waiting for the time to pass. Eventually, others arrived, some boys from his primary school, and he went and stood with them. The first to arrive, Greg, had always been annoying in primary school, stealing pens and making fun whenever possible. Now 
was no exception. He began laughing at Jim for forgetting his school bag on the first day. As each new boy from his primary school arrived, Greg insisted on announcing Jim's blunder. Oi, Jamie, guess what Jim's done? Forgotten his school bag. <laughs> Nobody else found it as funny as Greg, and mostly the boys were sympathetic. But nonetheless, his constant going on about it made Jim even more anxious. He didn't want everyone to know. Oh, shut up, Greg, he shouted after he had told Todd, the fifth boy to arrive, about Jim's bag. Greg, not wanting to appear weak in front of any of the boys around on the first day, turned on Jim and shoved him to the ground. What are you going to do about it, Jim? A couple of other boys pulled Greg away and he went off to see a friend who was just arriving. Jim scrambled to his feet. Great, he thought. I've been here five minutes and I've already got into a fight. Eventually, the bell went and he started the school day properly. He met the rest of his form group, who seemed nice enough, though by some unlucky circumstance, he was in the same group as Greg. It appeared that he had not forgiven him for earlier in the day, and often Jim would look up to find Greg giving him evil looks. Jim thought about telling his form tutor, Mr Kelly, who was a very cheerful and friendly man, but was too worried about the consequences. Besides, what could really be done about one pupil looking at another? Mr. Kelly took the pupils through their timetables and talked through the rules and expectations in lessons. This worried Jim even more. It seemed as if the whole system was set up to punish the pupils. One rule after another, after another, all of which resulted in a detention, if broken. Jim could feel the blood draining from his face when Mr Kelly mentioned that a detention would be given for forgetting equipment. Sir, shouted Greg from somewhere at the back of the class. Jim has forgotten his equipment today, sir. Mr. Kelly stared at him. Greg, do you remember what I said about calling out? Yes, sir, Greg replied, looking at his table while trying to appear humble. Well, don't forget it, Mr. Kelly said. Have you forgotten your equipment, Jim? Jim, at this point, was horrified into speechlessness. He had hoped that he would have been able to avoid saying anything in class for his entire time at school. And here he was, on his first day, being asked a direct question from the teacher. Even worse, it was about something he had done wrong. He could feel everyone looking at him and he could hear the silence. 
silence humming in the air. He wanted to say something, but no words came. In the end, he resorted to a nod. Mr. Kelly, some sympathy appearing in his eyes, said, Okay, today is your first day, so we let you off. Greg looked up in indignation. Just like I let Greg off for calling out just now. Greg looked back down. Make sure you bring it tomorrow. Jim nodded vigorously. The rest of the day was both tiresome and scary in equal measure. After spending one lesson with Mr. Kelly, he had English, then maths, then French. But rather than learning anything about those subjects, the teachers just repeated what had already been said in the first lesson. They all had stern expressions on their faces and Jim wondered why they bothered to do the job at all when they hated it so much. Finally, however, the school day ended and Jim had got through unscathed. He should have felt relieved, but there was still the journey home to think about. Originally, Jim was going to walk with his older brother, but circumstances had changed. John, it seemed, had got a new girlfriend and wanted to walk home with her. Sorry, Jim, but you know the way, don't you? John said. Jim nodded and gulped as he watched his brother walk off in the other direction. The route home was a worry. He had to take a narrow claustrophobic path that had high fences on either side. It began with a steep descent, followed by a sharp corner at the bottom which was supposed to be a popular waiting place for bullies and criminals. Older children from the high school called it Black Hill. To make matters worse, among the stories Jamie Warren had told in primary school was the one about the old woman who lived at the bottom of the hill. Apparently, she came out at the end of the school day to shout at pupils who walked across her front lawn. Jamie's mum had called her a witch because she put curses on people. The witch's son, according to Jamie's mum, was a drug addict, struggling to deal with his mother's wicked ways. For Jim, this was all too much, enough to make him walk any other way. But it was the quickest route home. And after a long day at school, the sooner he reached the refuge of his bedroom, the better. He began to walk down the path, and it was indeed steep. There was graffiti on the fence all the way down and this made Jim even more nervous. People, he thought, commit crimes down here. Even though it was the afternoon, it seemed dark along the path. Trees from the neighbouring gardens hung over the fences and blocked out a lot of the light. Jim began to walk faster. 
he made it to the halfway point when he heard the sound of boys talking at the top of the hill. He decided not to turn around and carried on, but someone called him from behind. Hey, Jim. He turned, and to Jim's horror, the voice belonged to none other than Greg. I want you to meet my brother and his friends. A menacing smile spread across Greg's face as three larger boys emerged behind him. Uh, I'm all right, thanks Greg. I've got to get back home, Jim shouted nervously, turning around and increasing his pace without bothering to hear what Greg had to say. But Jim's reply did not deter the boys, and in an instant he heard running footsteps behind him. Jim began to run too. He reached the bottom of the hill and turned the sharp corner. The boys were not far behind him. He could hear them laughing. One shouted, We're going to get you. Panicking, Jim sprinted out of the bottom of the alleyway and into the avenue. But, turning his head to see how far away the boys were, he tripped and landed smack bang on the grass. Now he was in for it. He could hear the boys coming out of the alley and there was no time for him to do anything. He couldn't run. He couldn't even get up in time. Soon they would be upon him. Oh no, thought Jim. This is everything I feared. Then something bizarre happened. The boys seemed to ignore Jim completely. Instead, they turned left and walked down the avenue and off home. It was as if they had forgotten they were even chasing him. Jim, not wanting to draw their attention back to him, stayed lying on the ground, but rolled over onto his elbow to watch them walk off in disbelief. When they were out of sight, Jim was just about to heave a sigh of relief when he heard a door open. Looking behind him, he realised immediately he was not just on any patch of grass. He was on someone's front lawn. And that someone was not just anyone. It was the old woman, the witch, surely come to put a curse on him. It was too late though, he had no time to do anything. She stood in the open doorway and stared at Jim. She was dressed in brown shoes smart grey trousers and a purple jumper. She wore large round glasses that matched her rotund figure and had a big curly grey hair. She leaned some weight on a walking stick in her left hand and she stared Jim would have got up and got off her lawn immediately, except he was so scared he couldn't move. You're welcome, said the 
woman and strangely she smiled. She spoke with an accent that Jim didn't recognise, but someone more worldly would have guessed she was from Cornwall. Jim scrambled to his feet, stepped off the lawn and brushed himself down in quick succession. I'm sorry I fell on your lawn, he said, the words moving so quickly out of his mouth. They were almost tripping up over each other to escape. The woman just looked at him and smiled. Would you like to come in for a cup of tea? What a strange question. Was this what the old woman did? Invite lonely pupils into her house and then cook them like some story in a fairy tale? Surprisingly, there was something inside Jim that was keen for him to say yes, as if something was calling him into the house. But sensible Jim, fearful Jim, knew better. No thanks, he said, trying to smile. Oh well, said the old woman, maybe tomorrow. And she closed the door. Jim walked home at a much quicker pace than usual. When he finally made it to his bedroom and closed the door, he heaved a sigh of relief. Would every school day be filled with so much stress and worry? We're going to leave it there today. We'll start again tomorrow evening and we'll start on chapter three. I hope you're enjoying this. We're just starting this story, of course. And I do sort of apologise for the church bells. Um, I do love church bells, but it might be <laughs> spoiling the, the story uh, a little bit. Um, it's only Monday night, so we won't have the church bells tomorrow night. On the other hand, you may actually be enjoying the church bells. <laughs> but yeah, that, if you're just joining, is the first two chapters of Jim and the Universe. Uh, PG Stone loved it. You wait, you wait till we get into this book. Honestly, it's such a lovely story. And, um, and you love the bells, so well, there you go. I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm going to upload this as a video for anyone who has missed the live. Um, so you can read uh, these chapters again if you miss any. But I will be back tomorrow, of course, 7 o'clock, Tuesday night. We're going to carry on with this book. We'll be on chapter 3 tomorrow. And uh, I hope you can join me. It's going to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday this week and um, probably the same next week we'll see how we do with the chapters well thank you so much for joining me those of you that have joined uh, those of you on catch up I hope you love this story as well and so I will see you tomorrow take care everyone bye bye